Good morning. Um, it's morning when we're recording this. It's the morning after what was a very disappointing uh, night before Quinny, but we're here after Celtic's been beaten at Celtic Park 2-0 by, by RB Leipzig. Um, and once again, it's another game we walk away from frustrated. It's became the same old cliches throughout this group after match day four. And it's been a story of not taking our chances and ultimately being punished. Yeah, big time. Like, it, it was one of those games where we were all, it, it was a six-pointer, you know, it was a huge one for, like, getting into a great position in the group where, like, looking beyond Christmas is then, like, people could do it, you know, and <laughs> you wouldn't feel too bad about it. Um, So it's, yeah, it's a real one of those ones where when the group was made, I was listening to, I actually had to be listening back to when the group draw, when the group stage was drawn, like, what our kind of thoughts were going into this, and, and even just the wider kind of Celtic community. And the two games against Leipzig, you know, like there was a lot of split reactions. Some people thought, oh, they beat the Rangers beat them last year, so oh, that you know they're not anything to be worried about. And then some other obviously quarters of the Celtic support obviously thinking, you know, they've just signed Werner, they've still got Nkunku and all these other great players. It's going to be a tough one. But no matter what your opinion was, the Leipzig games were always going to be the make and break of it. Because even if you fancy us to beat Shakhtar over two games, which obviously were you know we drew away, um, and you expect that we don't get anything from Real Madrid then it's always going to come down to the Leipzig games being, you know, the make or break of really second, maybe even third at this stage. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, that there's a lot we can pick out in this whole thing, which we're going to try and do in this next 45 minutes to an hour. Um, you, you talk about Shakhtar there in that. And I think I said that soon, um, the reaction point that we did after the Shakhtar game away from home, that that game, that point, um, the magnitude of it or how little it meant would be decided by the end of this group, it's not even going to be decided by the end of this group. We're probably deciding that after match day four. It looked all but that uh, Shakhtar were actually going to beat Real Madrid last night. Yeah. Um, if it wasn't for that late goal from from Rudiger. Um, but just in terms of Shakhtar, Quinny, that's probably the one you're now looking back on. You know, we mentioned this Leipzig was a six pointer as you describe it. We'll come on to that just just shortly. But Shakhtar, you know, if you look back match day two, um, it's one that you now look at thinking if they'd have won that game. It's a lot different the group, but that's, what I said. that's just that's just what happens in a tournament football when you've got so few games in such little time. Yeah, hundred percent. And you know the game like going into this, like I was at the game right, and um, I, I brought a friend up with me, you know, from Wales. He's um, you know a Celtic fan from afar, if you like, and uh, you know coming from some Champions League action. And by the time we got to the stadium to pick up tickets and whatever, we managed to see the team buses come in. And by the time we got to the like the superstore and we seen the Celtic buses come in. Like normally, when I've seen the buses come in, there, there was a fair amount of people there too. It wasn't as if it was dead, but it was normally. It, it, not, I was expecting it to be much more people because there's been much more in games gone by. And it was so quiet, Declan. And see, when the first bus opened up, it was just like coaches and translators and that came off. You could hear a pin drop when the team bus opened up and everyone was waiting to see Jota get off the bus. Like everyone. And honestly, see, as soon as the last player came off and everyone realised he's not on that bus, it was like... If silence could have got louder, it did, you know. Mm. And everyone walking off that bus, every one of the players, everyone felt it. I'm telling you, like it was normally it's we are Celtic, you know, all this stuff, you know, Champions League, we're having a party, all that stuff. And it was silent, you know. So I felt from that point, like it was going to be a really odd night, you know. It, was good. it wasn't going to be maybe one of these memorable. And if, if we were going to get the victory, it wouldn't necessarily be in line with some of these other victories we've had over the years at Celtic Park. It might have been a bit more tight or maybe a wee bit more fortuitous but right from the off like it did feel like this whole Jota thing did kind of run into the beginning of the match and then ultimately when he doesn't turn up it maybe took a wee bit of the wind out of out of all of our sales yeah but I think there's even a lot of people kind of in social media we know that can be a bit of a an echo chamber at times but it's an important part of what, what say it's news and how people are feeling and, and whatnot um, and obviously you'll only see the opinions of people you follow or, or ideas that maybe they'll um like or whatnot, but but Jota, you you could tell how how big a blow that was. It and Monday when firstly you get the, the Sky Sports video saying he's not in training. Um, you maybe get a slight bit of hope after Andrew Postecoglou's press conference saying you know two games after a uh, match day it, it's not uncommon for a player to be out. But it looks as if it looks as if it's nothing serious. He, he certainly said that after the game last night that uh, he might miss out in the weekend the game against Hibs, but 
shouldn't be anything serious. So you might see him return for the game in my way to Millwall in the Cup. But yeah, I think that was a big blow coming in. And again, you know, we speak about Celtic Park being a fortress and stuff. Um, and just last night, again, I, I thought people within the stadium once again very quickly turned on the players, which I don't think helps us in this stage. Um, you know, I, I don't want to specifically mention names of players because I think that's been quite well documented out there. Um, who's been the, 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 the boys getting the, the hardest of times? But yeah, I, I don't think that's that, that helps at, at all. You know, when you're trying to create a fortress, it's probably why you've got people like Marco Rose coming out with a comment like, Celtic Park's a fun place to play because, you know, the atmosphere at the start of the game, great. You'll never walk alone's always fantastic. The the anthem's always great, but it does dwindle after that. Unless you probably get that early goal um, as time goes on. I, I just thought it became flat. Yeah, it, it definitely did. And, you know, my kind of first take on that when I was in the stadium was, because again, like leading up to the game, I was seeing so many people that were like really like butthurt over those Rosa comments like, oh, this isn't Disney World, just kind of the vibe everyone was kind of giving it. And like, this should be feared and all the rest of it. But, you know, so I felt that maybe the atmosphere at the beginning almost, and again, I don't know if I'm reading too much into it, but that was just my kind of perception of everything. It was almost like a hesitancy from, you know, like the, the usual sections that are super loud. Like, you know, they weren't like going tonto like they normally do. I didn't, you know, I didn't see all that stuff. So I wasn't sure if they were maybe being a wee bit more reserved and was like trying to wait for the football to do the talking because normally that stuff doesn't matter. You know, the first whistle goes and we're, we're all on our feet and we're all going through the songbook, you know, leading the team into scoring, you know, rather than last night, it felt like we were waiting on them leading us. Yeah, no, I think that's a fair point. And, you know, I think that all comes from, as I say, Champions League nights when there are nerves and um, within the stands and on the park. There was nerves. If you do get that early goal, the place just erupts. And I think that's been, again, you know, I've only played one home game, uh, a before last night in the Champions League, Real Madrid, you know, we, we can do this all so much saying, you know, if this happened, if we'd have scored then, blah, blah, blah. But it probably does make a difference to players. You know, players have said, you know, Matt O'Reilly said on Monday that if the, the crowd's up for it and it's loud, it makes a player run extra kilometres and whatnot. So it probably does go into their mindset. And, you know, as time went on, I don't know if people started to, to doubt what we were probably trying to do. Um, mm. And... It's just one of those things. But just to go back, when he, you mentioned when the, the, the group stage came out the draw, I watched it with Inside Celtic Park with other fan media, and I looked at the draw and I thought, okay, yeah, that's pretty decent. Um, we've got a glamour draw in, in Real Madrid. We've got RB Leipzig. Yes, they, they made the semi-finals of uh, the Europa League last season, but they're a, a beatable team. They're not Bayern Munich. They're not Borussia Dortmund. Of course. Um, and Shakhtar, who you've previously said, you know, they are a Ukrainian champion. It's, and probably apart from that level, they've not really made big inroads uh, in European football. And have obviously, unfortunately, due to the, the situation which is ongoing, and Ukraine have lost a lot of players. Um, the bulk of their team is made up of Ukrainian internationals. But now I think when you probably sit down and look at the, the, the draw itself, um, you know, the, the RB Leipzig team that was drawn out against us is completely different now from that yeah. today team. Completely, yeah. Well, they, they made some good moves in the summer, of course, bringing Werner and Schlager into like Red Bull acolytes, you know, and that was kind of like that, that. That's really what we've seen from them over two games, and that's where, like, when I look at some of the negative reaction from the game last night, and where it up, it maybe not upset me, but where it like doesn't sit well with me is that a lot of a, a lot of football fans outside of Celtic Park, right? But forget, and you kind of mentioned this before we came on. But, you know, when you start a project to when the thing is a fully well-oiled machine, like fully, you know, like Leipzig, look at Leipzig, like how well, the, all those guys could have wore, wore blindfolds last night and they wouldn't have been too far geographically on the pitch to where they probably would have ended up out of ball and on the ball. And, you know, we've only had this guy, Ange Finn, for like, what, 16, 18 months? I think we've made amazing progress and that's obviously where all of our expectations, I'm the worst for it, my expectations go through the roof because I'm just a, you know, a silver lining guy. But these teams have went through, uh, all these clubs you, you can yardstick yourself against, have all had European campaigns, have been lackluster, have all had drubbins in different situations and not got it over the line. And it, like you say, at Leipzig, huge transformation from the beginning of the season through to the, the point they're at the now. But I kind of stick into like a real formula and a real system. And we've got to give Ange huge credit for kind of sticking to his formula in, in that respect for throughout this campaign. But it's... Like Leipzig for me, like when you look at the draw, 
I actually kind of disagree overall. Like, I don't think like, Leipzig are not Bayern, they're not Dortmund, they're not PSG, they're not Barca. I totally accept that, right? But as as we've kind of seen to be to be the case, you know, like they are like a really efficient European outfit. So mm. I don't go and again, I've seen people on Twitter saying this is the easiest Champions League group you're likely to get ish. You know, like a team like this and a is team there, like that. Is there ever an easy Champions League group? Realistically. I'd, I don't think it would be this, you know, like I could probably go back through the last five years of Champions Leagues and pick out a group every year that's easier than this, you know, like on paper. Um, because I, again, like the amount of money, like Leipzig might not spend like the way that Chelsea and PSG do and whatever, right? But they spend like way over the odds on guys when they're like 17 and 18 and then coach the crap out of them, you know, <laughs> to be like I say, an acolyte of like their, their system or whatever. So like... They have they they they've went through a period of losing their identity and regaining it to our kind of detriment over this last three weeks. That's kind of really when it's happened, and you, you know, like I, I do see some decent appreciation come out for the opponent after the game as well. Like, yeah, they played well and they didn't really, um, you know, give us a moment to to dwell on the ball or anything like that. But again, like I I just think they were wildly underestimated by. The, the Celtic fan like coming into this game because at, at this level they were talking about it's about taking the chances about those split decision moments and when you've got a team that run a system that literally can do the majority of it blindfolded you know then those split moments then can maybe swing in your favour when you know that all these people will blindly run into position and attack the ball in certain ways yeah, I think that's a good day, but point on, you know, RB Leipzig regaining identity under Marco Rose there's absolutely no doubt about that um, and Celtic, you know, coming back off the probably the Real Madrid game. Um, but, but, you know, I think I mentioned last week when, when there was that gap in the fixtures, I don't think that's helped some of the players. Um, it kind of stopped the rhythm of our games. And then, you know, th- this year also being a World Cup year, you generally kind of had two weeks between that RB game um, yeah. and you've not, you've had to play it a week right after. Less than a week, actually, uh, six days. After that, that wouldn't be common. Um, mm-hmm. That's just because where the World Cup lies, you know, you'd be playing uh, Champions League games well into the you know, November, the early December time. So yeah. that's another factor, you know, of it. And as well as that, that comes into the mix of injuries, which, you know, Ange Postecoglou has spoken about that, you know, game by game, if you look at last night, you know, in terms of starters, you know, Carlos Starfield, Jota and Callum McGregor are all your team. Those are three very important players, which again, probably talks to the strength and depth of your squad. Um, I know more at Shane's came in last night. I thought it was absolutely outstanding. Um, I thought more at Shane's was one of your top, top performers last night. Um, I thought O'Reilly did fairly well, you know, and I know he hasn't played all two. It's only, it was only second start playing that, that pivot role. Um, so, you know, I think when you bring that into context too, you know, tournament football like this, I think sometimes you do need a bit of luck. Yeah. You know, we, we can talk about the, the chances created, the shots and goal, the positions we've been in. But I also think the European football, especially tournament European football, you just need a wee iota of luck, which can come in the form of injuries from your perspective, the opposition having injuries, mm-hmm. the, the shape you find them in. You know, RB Leeds had come to Celtic Park last night before their first choice goalkeeper and captain also. Yeah. I did think the goalkeeper was uh, an opportunity missed as well because, like, even though, like, the shots on target from us were quite minimal, right, the amount of times we were close to picking his pocket on the press, you know, it was on, you know, and um, if we were able to keep, if we kept that vigour up, you know, if, you know, like you say, sliding door stuff, you know, a goal happens at a different point in the match and this happens and all the rest of it, but, you know, like, that goalkeeper is an opportunity because he's, like, firmly, like, uh, you know, not a Champions League goalkeeper. And he didn't even get a test last night. I didn't see him dive anywhere, really. You know, there was a few shots at the other end of the stadium for me, so I'm yet to see how well he done with them, you know. But by and large, I think he leaves the ground untested. Yeah, no, absolutely. And again, that, I think, can I goes into that element of luck that you get from that, that, you know, that, that was a chance there uh, to to put pressure on a goalkeeper who doesn't play all too often for, for RB Leipzig. Um and we didn't do that. And, you know, sometimes that's just what you need to do, you know, especially when you're, you're missing such key players. You know, you're certainly missing their captain. We know how big a player Jota's been for us. Yeah. Um, and we know how important that Carlos Starfield and Vickers Pern has been. But, yeah, Moritz Jens, um, I think, further deserves plaudits from last night. Really good performance. And, again, he's been somebody, just quickly touching him, Quinny, who took a bit of a flack after, you know, the defeat at St Myrne. Yeah. Um, I just don't think it's going to help any of the Celtic team just now to be, you know, have people diving on them because 
we're in the middle of October. There's still a hell of a lot of football to be played before the World Cup. Yep. We've got ten, nine or ten games before the World Cup. It's about getting to that point, trying to get there unscathed. We've still got two games in the Champions League, which will be important, even if we're likely not to progress. Um, I think Celtic fans still want to see a performance in the Champions League. 100%. And like, not all is lost at this point. You know, it's you know still in our hands to get Europa League um, if we were to you know, do what we need to do or what we should be doing against Shakhtar. Who again, we can we cannot even take them as lightly as we have been. You know, with you know they basically were on the cusp of beating Real Madrid in the Bernabeu last night, which also I think gives us some just hope. Kind of slip in with, with Shakhtar yeah. as well. They've con- consistently qualified for the Champions League as well. Shakhtar did it, you know. Yeah, Celtic. That was five years that Celtic had been in the Champions League, which needs to be taken into perspective. That, that's you know Celtic being away from the competition for that length of time isn't on Ange Postecoglou at, at all. As so those yep. going by and decisions made, you know, previous to that from, from board level and managerial level, that Celtic's been out of the Champions League for such a, a long time. Yeah. And like, that, that's what we're kind of talking about earlier in terms of being across like, the middle of the journey. Like, for me, after last night, Jens should ha- shouldn't have any doubters amongst us anymore, really. Like, Jens was quality last night. Carter Vickers, like, for me, like, I've, I've always, well, of course, like, every Celtic fan, Carter Vickers is held in really high esteem. But for me, last night, that was a real um, coming it was a real of captains, age. And it was a real captain's performance from him, wasn't it? Yeah, Carter Vickers was um, Im- imperious. You know, Werner and Kunku, these guys, they couldn't, you know, if they came anywhere near him, he was getting the ball and he wasn't going to give it away from them. Um, you know, so I, I think, you know, I, I think we have a Champions League centre-back pair in there, right? Now, that might sound a bit bold to say after the, the kind of situation that we're at there now, but the growth that they've had through this group, the stage that we find them at now and the the performances I would expect to see from them from the final two games, I think we will leave this campaign thinking, do you know what? Defensively, we're not actually that bad. And I think we all are in an agreement that the main problem is just putting the ball in the bloody net. But coming into the rest of these games, as well as anything that goes on beyond this season, like for all these other teams, having steady centre-back partnerships is huge. And to have two guys that are 23 and 24 years old that look Champions League calibre, that we've only had in the door two minutes... That's you know that that is a great um that, that's a great silver lining to take out from the game. Yeah, um, and again, you know, I was actually listening to something with Kenny Dalglish the other day, and he, you know, he says that if any team wants to try and you know get something, no matter what game it is, you need to keep the back door locked. Um, I mean, you, you've got two centre halves that play like that, you know, you give yourself the best chance of it. Um, but not to be just to you know, I think CCV really deserves this mention. You know, six yeah. championship loan spells, um, and, and he's carried up until date. He's only twenty four. He's captain Celtic in the Champions League last night, just taking a run through his 90 minutes of football. He had nine clearances, which was a match high. Um, he's a 90% pass accuracy. He completed four out of four aerial duels, which is a team high. Um, two out of two long balls completed, one block, zero fouls, um, which is you know, really, really impressive uh, stats at that level for a, for a defender. And I know people will say, you know, Ultimately, Celtic get beat 2-0. What are you talking about? Stats of your, your centre half are, but it's important that we do touch on this because it's important going forward. You know, Celtic get beat 2-0 by RB Leipzig can't just be seen as, you know, a, a referendum game, as in that's it, Caputo. And Postacoglu needs to tear it up, change his system, blah, blah, blah. That ain't going to happen. So it's about how we take from this point the, the things that we've learned um, and try and translate that into the, the remaining two fixtures and then looking forward to hopefully trying to get the league back, uh, winning the league again at the end of this season and getting back into the Champions League and having another goal and strengthening the squad even further after that. Yeah, I would agree. Well, so, see, see the one thing, like I, I shot you a wee message after like, the Ange conference um, on Monday, like when we were talking about Jota, will he make it or will he won't he kind of thing. And I was thinking, obviously we changed tact ever so slightly against St. Johnson at the weekend. Tax of Banovic basically comes in for McGregor. You're swapping somebody in front of the defence for somebody behind the attack, right, which is great. And then with Jota being out, I thought that would have been too much like surgery to the team that's been running for this season to this point, you know, to not have the sitter and then to not have Jota, who is the main, the main creator in the attack, you know. Um, so I was surprised he didn't start with a Moy or an Abogard and he opted to keep Haksabanovic and go with the front three. Because that, like, yes, it's important we keep with the system and whatever, but this kind of variation that we're kind of evolved into, like, I did feel last night that let us down. Like, O'Reilly was good. Rio was rotten, to be honest, right? And But I felt that both of those guys could have done with being 15 yards higher up the pitch. And the easiest way to do that is put somebody behind them. 
you know, because I felt like that we did some good pressing with the front four. And like I said, we almost picked the goalkeeper's pocket a few times. But Rio and O'Reilly were just not involved in any of the attacking at all, you know, and that wasn't really down to, you know, sometimes if the ball travels so far, you can only catch up with it to, to that point, you know. But our best games have been when those guys get onto the edge of the box and they're linking passes with each other, breaking the channel for Maeda or Abad or Jot, whoever it might be. But they were just nowhere near the final third. We were playing balls into Abada and Maeda and expecting them to beat these, you know, top end Champions League, Bundesliga guys one on one every time. And yes, yeah, sometimes they'll do it, but it was it was a bit folly, you know. I thought I was quite surprised ultimately is what I'm getting at, Declan, by Haksabanovich starting in midfield with no Jota. Did you what was your kind of take on that? Uh, my take yesterday when I actually spoke about this and I wrote an article on it was that I think always that Ange Postacoglu does stuff for a reason. Um, whether people like it, don't like it, he still does it for a reason. If you listen to him in press conferences, you'll get your answers. If you watch Celtic play football, you'll get your answers. There was a purpose and a reason why he played that midfield trio on Saturday. Um, I always thought that whoever would be the, the trio in midfield on Saturday would go into the game against RB Leipzig. And that was what he wanted to try. If it was going to be Abelgaard that started the game against RB Leipzig, I think he would have started them on Saturday. You know, yeah. he obviously seen something in O'Reilly who admitted that he'd played the, the pivot role for MK Dons and Fulham in his youth career. So he thought, OK, fire him in there. And by the way, I, I thought Haksibanovic played pretty well last night. You know, I think he's a, a guy as well who's not had a great amount of game time. He came in late in terms of not having a pre-season after being at Ruben Kazan and isn't, you know, probably fully up to speed yet. Um, but yeah, in, in terms of surprise, Quinn, I just think that it almost kind of revealed that at the weekend by playing that midfield three. Yeah. I uh, see. I thought Haksibanovic was quality. I've been putting some wee pieces of my content out on uh, like TikTok and that, and somebody responded on one of them calling him Hacksaw, and I'm stealing it. So that's what I've been calling him all week. Uh, his wee uh, Hacksaw. Hacksaw. Hacksaw's my <laughs> uh, nickname for him, um, which goes into a long list of, you know, Jura Welshie. <laughs> uh, you know, they've all got one. Um, but yeah, in but terms good. of that, what one? Hacksaw? Uh, ha- Haxa was good, yeah. Obviously, yeah. Maeda's coming out this game with all the haters. And I didn't think Abada impressed too well. I didn't really get a good look at his injury or whatever. But I, I, I did just feel as a four, like, they, they pressed well. And at times, there was some decent play. But ultimately, they never really interlinked and swapped and swapped around. You know, the, the best Celtic football we've seen earlier this season and at stages last year, we're seeing winger swap sides. We're seeing guys double up in the middle. We're seeing all sorts of, like intricate movement from those guys and as much as yeah we created some chances and all the rest of it I just felt that we didn't have you know we could have done with Rio and O'Reilly closer to them yeah. to actually you know obviously if you play both them higher up to them you maybe don't have a front four because one of them comes off for the Abelgard or the Moy but but that's something that came know. out of the St Murn game you know yeah. the, about creative midfielders people saying that we lack creativity in that game yeah and last night that there wasn't you know probably Haksabanovic was the, the shining light in that Celtic midfield last night in terms of Somebody showing for the ball, wanting to get on the ball and whatnot. Um, I thought Moy looked quality when he came on. Yeah, I thought it looked okay, but to, to me, Quinn, in terms of just the kind of bigger picture, the, the structure of football and whatever else, I think the reason why he wanted to, to go with O'Reilly and why you will see O'Reilly play that position is just the quickness of transition that the manager's looking for from back to front, which is really, really important to the way he's wanting to play football, which again goes back into the whole bigger question about the style of play at this level, People talking about game management, blah, blah. You know, when we look at it from the perspective of, you know, we play it from the back, you want to get the ball from the two centre halves, you want somebody to look for the ball right away and get it to the forward players and let them go and do their stuff. I think if you'd have played that Amoy, McCarthy or Abelgaard last night, that transition just doesn't happen as quickly, which is the reason why I think you wanted to play O'Reilly in that position. Sure. That makes sense. Do you think that's, do you think that possible? Yeah. The reason behind it? Just because uh, from what I've seen with Moy and stuff. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree because um, I, I was just thinking because like over the last two games, like since you know that's the kind of shape, I've noticed you, you, probably everyone's the same, but like we're we're getting out to the wings much quicker and much more often than if we did have a McGregor in there. It normally kind of dots around the little triangles in the middle. The fullbacks come inside, and then we try and build some play up that way. But when we don't have, it feels like with O'Reilly and Rio, we're just kind of. We maybe do a wee bounce pass between them and one of the defenders, and then we go full back, and then we go wing, and then we're trying to get out quickly. We're trying to go out, you know, across, you know, out in the flanks. And as I said, then Rio and O'Reilly are just getting left in 
lifting the dust behind the attack and they're guarding the defence. And then you've got Maeda with two guys on him. So that's the way Leipzig defend. And then he's looking for Kyogo, who's got, also got a guy marking him. And then Abad is on the other side of the pitch. And then Haksibanovic, is he catching up with players? Has it been a quick switch, like you say, it's a quick transition up the line? Maybe he's not. Well, we've now got two guys against three in the corner flag when they hope of getting out. They win the ball. We've then got three or four guys out of spot. And then that's how they attack. They didn't actually get any joy, of course, until the 70th minute or whatever. But I just felt that we missed a bit in the middle where when you do run up that line and you are maybe in a 3v2 situation, you need to have one or two bodies in there. And if you think about peak Celtic this year, McGregor, O'Reilly and Rio, they get to the edge of the box, the three of them, between the edge of the box and the halfway line. And no matter what happens with the wingers and the fullbacks, there'll be one or two of them there to get you out of trouble and then try and find the space and then try and get us into the box for something. And that kind of sequence of events just never happened enough. And yeah, it might have still worked, but I feel that that was something we could have done well last night. That's been something I've noticed too, Quinny, is getting the ball out wide more often in the past two games, which I think then begs the question, and we can then enter that into the, the conversation, or if you're going to get the ball wide like that, and you're looking for a target man or somebody to hold the ball up in the middle, you know, if that's going to be the way we're playing football, you know, I, I think, you know, I don't want to be harsh on Kyogo at all. I'm not going to be harsh on Kyogo. I think he's been excellent since he came in. He's just hitting a bad patch of form. He'll come back. He'll score plenty of goals for Celtic. But one thing with Yakimakis I've noticed ever since his arrival at Celtic is that when he plays consistently um, and gets game time, he does score goals for Celtic. And there's been a lot of debate from people. I still think that Kyogo's our best striker. Um, yeah. You know, even after the show last night, I still think he's Celtic's best striker. But I think that when you're maybe looking for that target man, and we certainly, you know, a couple of chances we had us last night. If you're going to stretch games, and maybe especially in the Champions League, when you do need somebody to hold it up, and I'm even thinking back to, to you know, under Neil Lennon with Georgie Samaras, he could always do it. Yeah. And that might have just been a bit of a difference last night if we had a big, powerful striker up there that was always a target. You know, even I'm thinking, going back to the Rangers game, you know, I remember when Kyogo went off and it was almost a big kind of, a, a side within the stadium was, you know, just over a month ago when, when, when Yakimakis came on. But that game, he absolutely ran his heart out. You know, he drops deep. He was coming to the halfway line to win balls to then yep. flick on. And if you're going to stretch games, because, you know, I, as you've rightly pointed out, our structure's going to be completely different without Callum McGregor because you just simply can't replace him. Yep. O'Reilly admitted that. You can't replace Cal. But if you're going to do that, and as you say, Hatati and O'Reilly just kind of been left in the wilderness when you go do go in the attacks and get the ball wide. But do, do you think that, you know, Yakimakis might need to be the man that you're looking at fixtures like this? Well, one thing I've been saying to you for so long this season is I was waiting for the day we would see Kyogo and Yakimakis together. And if we are going to have a front four of essence, that's kind of what I thought, like, it's maybe a bit, that's why I thought this a wee bit too much kind of surgery with no jaw I've been in there. You know, a bad in my head on the wings. We've well, got Kyogo through the middle. That's not really a combination of three I don't think we've came across too often under and you know, unless it's been forced upon us, which I suppose it sort of has in a roundabout way. But I wasn't ruling out Jack and Marcus through the middle and Kyogo off the left, you know. Um, that was what I said going into the game, actually. Um, yeah. But again, I think the last time we probably Max played that was on the right, and then was, was that, at Moy, you know, like that's yeah. kind of what I thought he would have went with, something like that. But it's been something I've not tried all too often, hasn't it? I think probably the yeah. last time I can remember it is at Ibrox. So if you're going to do stuff like that, you, you need, you know, it's not a case of trial and error, but you need, you need to, to play up. it and yeah. warm it up. That's it. You know, it's just like players in the squad, they need game time, and um, that needs game time to flourish. And if you go into a Champions League game and try it and it doesn't work, you're, you're the person that's going to need to take responsibility for it. Yeah. Big time. I do feel that uh, the weekend Jack Amakis let himself down when he was on the ball outside of the box. Like some of the passing he made at the weekend was rotten. So I don't know if he's maybe hurt his chances to get into the game tonight, even though he scored the game winning goal. But I don't know if that's maybe played a, pa a factor in it. And the other thing that, that adds into that that really did frustrate me last night is why rest Kyogo for the full 90 minutes at the weekend to not Same play him 90 minutes mm. like last night? Like I, when he came off, I was baffled like why take him off he, you didn't play him at all at the weekend surely it's to play 90 minutes today you know yeah and, and I kind of looked at it Quinny, thinking he's definitely going to start because there was a reason why he got left out at the weekend and never featured at all but yeah. even w with that in mind you know a, a player scoring a 95th minute winner they, they must seriously be up here really much in a high and to maybe not start that you know because as you rightly said you probably could have featured both of them 
and a front three. We know that Maeda's been off the boil. You know, I'm a real big fan of Daisy Maeda. That's not changed. I, I think he needs a, a bit of time out of the team to get back to the levels that you've seen. You will probably see that. I mean, you'll be on praising him once again. Um, but yeah. I'd have said there'd been less risk in playing Keogh over Maeda last night. Just from what yeah. we've seen recently of Daisy Maeda. I thought he'd have, I thought I think Abada would have been the one to leave out, to be honest. Um just with him he's kind of off the boil as well. And he's younger. You, you maybe need to look after that kind of situation a bit it's better. It's important to mention twenty one year old, you yeah. know, and this is his first Champions League campaign as well. So I think that's a really yeah. important point to mention when we're, we're talking about perspectives here. And he's cut some good teeth over over this season, don't get me wrong. But um but I I I, I thought I, I wouldn't have seen that been out of the question, Maeda, Kyogo and, and Gigi. But when the subs were rolling in second half, right? Maeda almost scored probably one of his nicest chances of the game when he was the last attacker. He was like, oh, the Cut four back. subs had been made. Yep. Yeah. And his body just was, I don't think his body was really set for the Honestly, the mate, chance. I seen him. I seen him look at the board and see his number didn't come up. And he looked at, you know, he proper, you know, he's like, right, I'm still on. And then like two seconds later, that cutback happened. And as soon as he hit him, I asked a goal. I could just, because he has a, he has, you can tell. The, Confidence player. He, he, he's not stupid. Yeah, you know I mean, he can feel the temperature of the room. He knows we're nervous. He knows he's missing chances. He knows that even the crap chances that nobody would score, bad luck, he's on the end of it. And people go, oh, that's another chance, you know? <laughs> and it just compounds and makes it worse. But um, but I, I think like at that point, because the last sub of the game is Maeda for Bernabe, right? I think at some point, you, you could have took off Maeda and left Kyogo and Jackie Marcus on the pitch at some point, you know? Um, I know I've had I come off on injury and that maybe that changed the plan or whatever, but um, yeah, I, I just thought that we, we maybe missed an opportunity to, if we're going to go with four forwards, let's see the four guys that have been here the longest, maybe, you know, let's see Kyogo and Gigi in particular link up in this system somehow. Yeah, well, listen, that could be something that we can probably, that Ange might consider to uh, look at now going forward, you know, because you can make changes throughout a season depending on where you're at with your squad and stuff. And at this point in time, Celtics have an absolute bugger all look with injuries. Yeah. Um, so maybe something that looks at. But Connie, just to kind of bring us back and both those players, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of things. They're not Champions League level quality, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They both between them scored 37 goals last season. I know they weren't playing Champions League football. Yeah. To me, it's not that they're not Champions League level quality. Yakimakis is the only player out of both to have previously played in the, the Champions League. Hugo's never played in the Champions League. He's very likely to go and play a World Cup tournament in um, just over a month's time. To me, it's not about them being Champions League quality is about both turning up when they need to in these occasions and as of yet both haven't yeah I don't think and again it's part of the reason I had to keep Kyogo and I don't really think he and again there was chances that I didn't say him from me you know but other than that I don't think he really get fed many opportunities to even have a shot last night and really try and own the game I don't think we got supplied to him well enough but again on this point I seen somebody say that oh, put into, I think it was a boy Hamill who does football daily he was like um Put into perspective, Celtic's front three cost like yeah. Ha- Hamill put out a lot of really, but, but I would describe as really decent tweets last night. Um, yeah, I think like, twelve million. I think was the the figure. And then he's like, "Oh, Timo Werner gets paid that in a year, which is nice context, right?" But also that kind of we all agree that we got a steal with these guys. We all agree that if these guys were European, if they were Belgian, they were Spanish, they were Portuguese, they would have all cost the same price with a one at the beginning. You know, and they wouldn't be at Celtic, most and they likely. wouldn't be at Celtic, right? So we can't, on one hand, say, "Oh, we've got a bargain," and then go, "Oh, well, we're only spending three million. What do we expect?" You know, it's one or the other. And in moments, you know, people will choose maybe the one that's actually the less prevalent. But I think, as you say, in the fullness of time, we're going to see these guys getting. And again, what everyone needs to also bring into the context when we've seen the best of Dyson and Kyogo at the club. They had already played a full season in Japan, so they were mm-hmm. fully up and running, fully confident, scoring goals, free flowing, and we've seen basically the best versions of them. And it's the manager's job now to reignite that because there's no excuses over the next few weeks, you know, really. Yeah, and I think everybody was saying, you know, during the summer months, it was exciting to think both dies and Kyogo's going to get a rest, going to come in full pre-season, blah blah, but it's not happened. Um, I don't think it's really happened for any of the forwards at Celtic as of yet, Kearney, that we've not seen the same heights that they've had. That goes for Matt O'Reilly coming in in January, who was excellent. He's not been at that level. Um, and it's it's how they, they get to that level. Um, once again, it looked as if they were starting to build up to kind of crescendo, you could probably say, you know, thrashing yeah. down the United 9-0, um, beating Rangers 4-0. And 
then getting at the game against Real Madrid, which is disappointing. But I, I still look back and that game that got cancelled, and think that's been one of the, the changing points so far. Taking yeah. a it's like a pothole in the road, isn't it? Yeah, no, absolutely. And you know what? Again, I mentioned earlier, if it wasn't a World Cup, you wouldn't have went Real Madrid one week away to Shakhtar the next week because you've had the break in between games. Yeah. Um, and it was like a pothole in the road, and ever since then, it's just kind of. It's not fallen off a cliff, but it's it's just been the, the the summary of our campaign. I think it's fifty four shots that we've had, um, <laughs> seventeen in target, and we've walked away with two goals, which is, you know, you can't just keep putting it down to luck. But it's about players stepping up, performing at the top of their game. And I don't really think for many Celtic players, we mentioned more at Shanks, especially last night, Vickers, in terms of the attacking players in the four games. Would you say anybody's really performed at their true potential level that we've seen of them in a Celtic jersey? I know we've not seen them in that level of Champions League football, but in a Celtic jersey, from what you've seen, would you say anybody's really hit the mark in terms of attackers? I think Jota against Shakhtar did, you know, was like pretty exceptional for the chances he missed and whatever. Um, and maybe Kyogo has had some moments, but overall, no. Like, no one's outside of the defence and maybe some of the guys in midfield, like, these guys still need to really like, you know, they they do need to prove themselves on this level and they sent the, they need to get the goal. As soon as they start scoring at this level, or as soon as they start feeling effective as a team or as an individual, that's when I think we see a good level of performances. The horrible part about that kind of reality is that we're four games into a six game campaign and it's not came yet, you know. Because one of the goals I think early in the campaign, if I remember right off the top of my head, is was an OG as well, you know. Yeah. The Hatate you know, goal in Shakhtar, yeah. Uh-huh, you know, so there's like, you know, it's it's one of these things like the players want to, you know, get their first goal in the Champions League. They want to get their first win at home in the Champions League. And with these things don't come, it, it, you know, it, maybe some of the players, it's a validation thing. You know, if you were to go out and beat Real Madrid in the first game, you know, for example, or whatever, then everyone's like, oh yeah, let's go. And it changes perceptive uh, perceptions and attitudes with the players in particular. Um but I think that's kind of where we're staged, where, where, where the stage we're at with the attackers is they definitely have the ability to beat Champions League level defenders one on one. They're definitely able to create chances at the Champions League, um, but for whatever reason, shots on target and actual balls and nets, they're just not happening. Yeah. So you, you agree with myself that it's not that our strikers aren't Champions League level quality, whatever that is. It's that they're just not performing at this level as of yet. Yeah. I guess I would go along with that, yeah. Because again, like we've referenced a few times, like we're halfway through this journey. These guys, like, you know, they're 24, 25, 26, some of them. They need games like this where, you know, in their career, it's unfortunate they need, they're need they doing it at Celtic, you know. It'd be nice if they could have done this in Portugal or something before they came to us, you know. But, it, we, you know, we brought them in from where we brought them in and it is what yeah. it is. Good, mor- good morning to Ismail Asoro there with, with that one. <laughs> And Mikey Johnson, actually, I think that's two that's out in Portugal. <laughs> no, but like, yeah, but yeah, so like, if you think about Leipzig, right, every player that they sign comes from Salzburg. Salzburg every year play deep into the Europa League or get to Champions League group stages. So whenever they're buying any player, they've got somebody that's already had the crap games in Europe and not scored the goal and missed the chance and gave away the yellow card and that kind of stuff. Whereas we're having to take the lumps with the players together and it's just not as fun. Yeah. But I think they will get there. Yeah, so that probably goes into the, the, the idea, Quinny, that, you know, I've mentioned this before, you know, as opposed to Coglu talks about being on a roller coaster, slapping yourself in for the ride, putting your belt on. And it's then that you, you're basically saying that, that with this, this journey, if you want, under Ange Post Coglu, which we hope it is, that you're going to need to take these hits and the players are going to need to take these hits to get to the end part of it. The, the good part's not going to come before we probably need to experience this. Is that, was, is that what you're probably saying there, that, you know, you, you'll take this from this season, but it must, it must progress next season if you're back in the Champions League? I think, uh, yes, uh, totally. Um, but I think I want to see that from the last two games because, again, really, when the group stage was drawn, most people probably had it around their head that the last two games are the most important, you know, at that point. Real Madrid were so glad to get them on the last day because hopefully they just throw the towel in and rotate like mad and whatever. And, you know, Shakhtar, that's probably the six-pointer because it's probably between us and them for third. That's probably the most pessimistic fans' outlook at the beginning of the group. So now that we find ourselves here, it's about dusting ourselves off. Spilled milk is spilled milk. And, you know, the lessons that the guys have learned, you know, and I was actually giving Hitate some really good praise at the weekend because he's 
at the weekend, they got much closer to the edge of the box, you know, in the attacking sense. And it feels like after he's played against Modric and then after he's played against uh, Schlager and Campbell last week, like he's seeing, oh, this is how these guys play. And this, oh, that's a nice move the way they've done that there. But see, last night, he was trying all this stuff that Modric and all that do, the whole, like, you know, let the ball run through you and walk onto it and leave the man back. He was trying all this stuff and he was just mm. getting done. He was losing possession. He was just getting his pocket picked. And I think, like, hopefully Rio's went through this period of the Champions League group stages. And for the last two games, the kind of Rio we've seen against St. Johnson and in his better performances, if we can get that Rio on Champions League, then maybe that's when the strikers start to get put through on goal a bit more often and start to get better chances created. Because Rio's been quality when he's on it. But last yeah, night he was absent. And with him, you know, after that goal against Malibu, Ange Postecoglou was really clear to, to, to kind of raise the, you know, Hatate's journey in football, which he, Hatate had spoken openly about going into the Champions League campaign. But once again, Ange wanted to remind people of that after the Malibu game. He's only properly been playing playing professional football for two years just due to the university system yeah. in Japan, um, which is quite incredible to think. So all those guys you talk about, Quinny, at Salzburg, the top level qualities came up against in Champions League football. You know, he's absolutely, at this point in time, in terms of experience, nowhere near that at this point in time. Yeah. And it's why, you know, this, this group stage campaign will be a massive learning curve in the rest of his future, um, which we hope, you know, as a top player, is going to be at Celtic and not elsewhere. That it's not just going to be a case of, you know, that the technique hits at us rather than elsewhere, yeah. and then they go <laughs> and move on to another. You know, we, we don't yeah, want yeah. that to happen, do we? No, for sure. Um, so I'd love to see, like as I say, everyone just it, it, within the club, you know, just goes right. It's two two cup finals. We kind of knew we'd probably be here anyway. We are here anyway. So let's just, you know, charge on as best we can because it's not un uh, unsurmountable what's in front of us. You know, Shakhtar as great as their results have been over the course, like, they've been plucky, you know, like, <laughs> they counter-attacked Leipzig like mad, and they actually yeah. scored. Yeah, especially in the first game, um, and, you know, people would maybe say they get a bit um, a luck against us, but the amount of chances that we created against them, and, um, you yeah. know, that their manager, I think he practically felt his knees at the end of the game, and he was full of praise for, for the way that we attacked the game, so... It's one that you need to look at, you know, and I look at the Shakhtar game um, on the 25th of October, Kone, is one that might not be crucial in terms of our European outlook this season, depending on what happens in the Santiago Bernabeu. I think a lot of Celtic fans are saying, it's done, that's it for Europe this season, okay, move on. But it could be crucial in our European campaign the next season if we're back in the Champions League or wherever we find ourselves in European football because going out and getting a good performance and result against Shakhtar could go a long way next season to getting them one the monkey off the back of not winning at home in the Champions League. I know Celtic last night equaled the, the record of the most games lost at home in the Champions League. And I think that's the new record which is one you know not to be proud about at all. Not so I think all. that game on the twenty fifth of October is really, really important for the whole context of things because just okay. looking forward, um, you know, we talk about a journey in Durange we talk about trust in the process. We need to win a game at home in the Champions League. And sometimes with the pressure off a wee bit, you know, I don't think there's probably going to be as much pressure on the Celtic team as there was in that Leipzig game last night. Yeah. Players might just step up and we might see the best of some of them at this level eventually in match day five. Yeah, it's a six-pointer. And I'm just thinking, like, I'm pretty sure one of the years we got to the knockout round of the Champions League, I think we beat Shakhtar in the final game. Was it maybe a Donati goal or something like that? Or maybe a McDonald's goal? I forget. But... um. Or maybe I'm maybe it wasn't the last game of the group, but you know we've played we've played Shakhtar in these kind of monumental occasions before, and like we've mentioned earlier, you know this podcast and other ones like they are like a Ukrainian Premiership team. But part of the benefit that they've had for being Shakhtar for the last twenty years is that they've got a really strong youth academy, and all these young guys are always been played with Brazilians and all that anyway. So when they are kind of dismantled at this point, they've still got some talent in there. You know the goalkeeper and the winger are the two big players, of course, and then. We Marion Shved's been okay for them, but they are just they are just being plucky. They are just sticking to a system, taking their chances when they come, and they're they are playing for a cause as much as anything. They're playing for much more than their football team. But come to Celtic Park, like that's not that's not an opponent. That's not a situation that we should be down in tools over at all. You know, we are Celtic. You know, we we are Shakhtar come here, and we are not expecting or not, not that we're not expecting, but. 
We shouldn't be writing that off. We should be, like you say, get that win for all the benefits that come from winning. And then you go into the last game and, you know, they're down in tools. Real Madrid are home and host. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Um, just to bring in a wee comment from Ange, um, which could probably uh, help us for our last 15 minutes, just to bring him in here. He says that, I know people look at the end product. He was a bit unlucky on a couple of occasions today, but he just puts an enormous work rate. We felt that from last week, on the right hand side, it can be a freight going forward. I thought his defensive work was outstanding. This was obviously I'm talking about Dizamida, sorry. Should yeah. have mentioned that. Um what we really outstanding. Without um and that helped us as a team. He's got to learn the other side of the game at this level. It's really important in terms of finishing in and the end product. He keeps getting into those positions. Every game he does, goals elude to him. We can't just scrap him because he's not the finished product yet. We've got to pers persevere. The same with all our players apart from Joe. You look at the rest of them age-wise and experience-wise, this is a massive jump for them. So there's a, a bit from Ange Postacoglu um, and Dyson Maeda. Um, probably brought that in when we were talking about Dyson. But, but there's one quinnet. And again, you know, at 24, he's by no means the end product. This is the first time he's played Champions League football. He's very likely to go away to a World Cup Um you can't just scrap. I mean, last week people were saying drop Joe Hart after, you know, the howler. Look how important it was yeah. with some of the saves last night. It was very important. It was, you know, if I think back to that Stevie May chance at the weekend, um, yeah. you know, you, you can't just think that a, a game's a referendum because it just doesn't work like that football. No, not at all. And uh, yeah, I thought Joe Hart was quality last night. Very unlucky to not, you know, I've, at one point, you know, I couldn't believe, at one point it was like they've, they didn't look like scoring. They weren't really getting anywhere near us. And it was just typical lives are on the break, just slicing us open. But yeah, I thought Joe Hart. And as I say, that kind of diamond, uh, Hart, the centre-backs and O'Reilly, especially in the second half when, you know, they started scoring goals and, and, deep, and dropping off a bit more. But that diamond really, you, you could have put that into a lot of different Champions League teams and it probably would have, you know, looked apart. They were just, they, they were all really good. And I, I think they were definitely... They were they weren't as phased by the stage or their duties in the match. Like I remember seeing like Werner running the channel and Vickers is chasing him down and thinking, is Werner going to do him here? But no, nah, big Vickers just steps in front of him, gets the ball, and he's cool as calm. And you know, and he's like, I'll, I'll just pocket big Werner, no problem. And then again, there was another point in the match right in front of me, Greg Taylor. It was actually it was almost close to being calamitous, but Greg Taylor's in left back comes into the box with the ball from like maybe one of their corners or throw ins. And we've got like the whole defence in the box all standing, <laughs> kind of looking at Greg Taylor and he's having to take a few different touches and whatever because he's got some pressure on him and whatever. But, you know, I, I, I thought that, I, I say I can't say enough. I really do feel that the defence actually did all pretty well. Um, and it was, yeah, it really does just come back to taking the chances. And my with Maeda, like, he basically played right wing back in Germany. And last night to see him play a bit more further forwards, like if he doesn't get the goals, he's always going to be in line for criticism. It is disappointing, but I think ultimately his attributes of what he brings mentally, his determination and all that stuff that we've heard him demonstrate before, as well as his engine and all that stuff that when we do go through this journey, like you're saying with a guy like this, like if we, I was expecting to get 15 goals this season, you know? Still Make good. Still There's no reason why he can't. But, you know, like if we get that player on top of this, what we've got, then that's a real weapon at this level, you know, because Shakhtar's real weapon is a guy called Mudrik, and he's just a quality winger, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's about exploiting that weapon. And again, we've got weapons, but, you know, can we exploit them? Well, the guy's not scoring goals, so it's probably not worth really focusing on optimising him. Let's focus on optimising Kyogo. And then it's like, you know, you're in spinning plates because we're missing some players, no Jota, no Calmac, whatever. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, I think one player to just kind of throw it at the mix is well done to James Forrest last night. You know, I think he's came in for a lot of criticism. Very useful. Um, very, very <laughs> useful. He came on. I thought he played well. He looks in good shape. It'll be interesting to see, you know, I had said, you know, ages ago when he signed that new contract, when that he will feature for Celtic this season when he signed the new contract, people you know, become a bit popular and whatever else. I, I didn't think my world is dreams that you would have likely have seen him come on in the Champions League. But, he didn't do a sell any harm last night to be said to the manager, you know, I'm available for selection. And I think over the course of the next two games against Hibs on Motherwell, you will see him start one of those games. Interesting. He put two or three good balls into the box. I don't think he ever lost the ball. He's not good at tackling and pressing and stuff, you know, like, I do feel... It's never like been his game, has it? Never been his game. Nah, he's like dead hesitant, you know, he's like, oh, do I go to the ball now or do I stay in the position? He's always kind of in two minds or three minds of what to do. 
But yeah, like in the final third, he'll beat a man, he'll get to the byline and he'll put a ball in. And Jack Amakis' couple of chances all came from the right-hand side at the end, you mm-hmm. know? Um, so yeah, we, we, we Forrest, you know, he done his, um, yeah. And again, like we've said about him before on this channel, he'll be useful. He'll come in on times. And he, I was saying to the guys around me, when he came on, people were like, oh, Forrest. And I was like, well, he's in great nick. He's not played all year. You know, mm-hmm. he's going to be 110%. So that should be the Forrest that we get. And I think we did kind of get that Forrest for the, the little period that we has for them. But even in that, when you're, you're saying that he's not played all year, I think that's been another issue for, for Celtic. And it's something I asked the manager about in Monday. And the presser was, <clears throat> big batch of fixtures, you're going to rotate, you'll get to see different players at different points. And he agreed that, you know, some of them desperately needed 90 minutes at the game at St. Johnson at the weekend. And sometimes when we have rotated, the issue has been that a lot of these players just aren't getting the minutes just now. And you, you need game time to really be in a, a run, which I think was an issue at St. Johnson. I think once that comes and you're seeing everybody, you know, with a good bulk of game time, you, you'll see the best of this Celtic squad. But I just don't think at this point in time you're really seeing the best of it. No, I'd agree. And I think the rotation policy is borderline detrimental at this point. Like with what you're saying, we get a bit of lack of cohesion now. And on top of that, like I've moaned about before, that I know get, guys look at this, the clock and see it's 55 minutes and think, shit, I'm getting subbed off in five minutes. I better start shooting, try and get a goal, you know? And then we just have bad um, decision making. And then, you know, people are shooting from different places or playing different passes because they want to get the ball back to themselves in the box from the winger or something and making those kind of selfish choices because they know they're going to get rotated. And then we're now suffering from, I say, a bit of lack of cohesion because of rotation there again. In the last f- five days, a lot of that, more of that has been forced upon us with Jota and McGregor and even Starfield, you, may, you might even say, I don't know, but um, Welsh, whatever. There's been a, there's, even in defence, there's been a lot of moving parts, a lot of changing pieces is my point there. Um, so yeah, it would it would be great to get some period of consistency or out of like nine of the starters, like and we, we're almost there, but I think it's been like seven starters have been quite consistent recently. And, you know, that plays a huge part, I think. Yeah, no, it certainly does. It, it plays a huge part that when you do have players drop out due to injury, um, like, you know, we've said Jota, McGregor, Starfield, you know, throwing people in and they're rusty um, because a lot of these guys just aren't getting the game time that they needed. You know, James Forrest could have very easily came on last night and looked, you know, completely let the game pass him by. Thankfully, he didn't. But, you know, I think apart from the game against Ross Coon in the Cup, I can't really remember Forrest featured all too much. I know he came on last week as a sub against Derby Leipzig, but, you know, I can't really remember anything at a time apart from that. So, even in midfield last night, you know, Haksabanovic, he's only really started playing for Celtic since that away game against uh, Shakhtar. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's another one. Abelgaard's another one too. Yeah, I did that. So, you know, there's players in the Celtic squad that aren't, as of yet, up to speed, which in match day four of the Champions League, you might be asking yourself a question about that. And again, it probably goes into the mix of how quickly the games have came for us. You know, different different year. Um, you're not having these games come as thick as fast as us. And you're having that wee chance to press the pause button look at it properly, which I'm sure Celtic are doing, but it must be really, really difficult for any team around the the, the world at this point in time, when especially European football, to be going so quickly, you know, Saturday, Tuesday, Sunday, Wednesday, because the information you're absorbing within that time, whether you're a football player or, or not, you know, I know these guys are paid good money to take all this in, but they're only human at the end of the day, and it must be really challenging at times to go from, you know, su- such rapid games time and time again yep. and when you're not rotating and players are constantly playing Celtic do at times look burned out to me um, which is why you need to rotate players and have them ready to rotate you know players like Burnaby I think at the weekend really needed that 90 minutes under his belt yeah I, and, but, but, and when Burnaby came on um, as well it was, it was kind of nice to see him get the minutes and get onto the pitch because again we might need him at some point and like these guys getting their teeth cut like you said and, and that kind of stuff I think is is all too invaluable, but on that kind of point, that's what um, that that that's what does kind of upset me about this whole like how much a player gets paid and what the value of a squad is and all that stuff. Because like you could pay me to you could pay me eighteen million pound a year to play football for Leipzig, but I'm not going to be Timo Werner overnight you know, or ever, you know. Or you know, you look at Aaron Ramsey going to Juventus and getting paid a quarter of a million pound a week. That's not because he's amazing; it's because he's got a great agent, you know. Like so, some of these things are so abstract that you know, like the the value of the squad, the wage budget, 
it may, yes, maybe it comes into it at the very tippy top, the very absolute guys that get to the quarterfinals and semifinals and whatever, because you will be paying mega money for guys that are the best in the world. But for everyone outside of the top, let's say seven clubs in the world, money's all circumstantial. You know, there's quality players that would walk into our team and walk into Leipzig's team. They get paid a thousand pound a week right now somewhere. You know, it, so it's it's all quite quite relative. It's all quite circumstantial. I think you know a million pounds a week. You mean a thousand pounds? <laughs> a, a thousand pounds a minimum wage, maybe. Oh, yeah, I'm telling you, there'll be guys in the Austrian league that get paid like nominal amounts, Belgian league, Portuguese league and whatever, and next year they're going to transfer into some big clubs and they'll be on mega money all of a sudden. But it, point being, like, you know, it's only the big clubs that pay the big money. And yes, it only goes to the best players in the world, but we've paid guys lots of money and they've been rubbish, like mm. Comper and whoever else over the years, Borictor and whatever. <laughs> doesn't guarantee you anything, you know? No, it so, doesn't guarantee you anything. And again, I think probably the bigger issue in terms of when we start talking about budgets and money spent, you know, Ange Postacoglu has spent a fair whack of, of money. I mean, we've recruited really, really well with what we've brought in. You know, you, you mentioned that, Quinny, that especially the guys from the J League, you know, how much would they be playing for, for players like that? From, you know, top five leagues in the world in terms of, yeah. you know, goals and assists and whatever like that. But, you know, t- to me, it doesn't... T- to me, I've always looked at a picture of this that last night doesn't tear up the, the bit of paper that this Ange project, or whatever you want to call it, is anybody thinking that he's going to change his approach to football doesn't know anything about Ange Postecoglou. Um, having, you know, not studied him, but tried to get into his psyche. I've read his book, Changing the Game. I've watched countless interviews with him. I've spoke to him in press conferences. He's not going to change anything. So it's then about the personnel. When you're playing that football, is the personnel bang on are they at the top of their game? So far for Celtic at the Champions League this season, the personnel's not been bang on form at the top of their game. So that's yeah. something we look at. As well as that, to compete at this level, you know, we talk about money in football and whatever else. Celtic haven't consistently been in the Champions League for a long period of time. Um, you know, two years under Brendan Rodgers is not consistency. You know, yep. a couple of years under Neil Lennon is not consistency. You're going back to Gordon Stanton to talk about consistent runs in the Champions League. Yep. And for the riches in football that you're not going to meet in the Scottish League, you know, we've been out of the competition for five years. To me, both go hand in hand. That When you do qualify for the Champions League and bring all these riches in, that's about how you manage your squad, how you fix other things like the youth uh, team that, that's coming in, investment in that to make sure that you've got that coming into your side um, and just do the overall bigger picture. And that's why, you know, whether we took a hit this year in the Champions League or not, it's going to be an important year. One, the point you touched on, Quinny, building a mentality in the team of players that, you know, to, to read this one out, you know, Celtic, majority of the team last night were under 25, so there's a young team there like, like there is down south at Arsenal. That's building towards something. Um so- but when you're looking at it from from the, the perspective of it's not it's not the end of the road for this team, absolutely it's not. Um, but you either took a hit this year or not. If we got third place in Europa League, I wasn't going to be dismayed. I was going to actually be quite happy with that. If or not, it's about going again next year, making sure that league title is our focus, getting back in the Champions League and using the money that we've got this season in the Champions League to add to the squad. That that period of being consistent at this level is only going to come with using the money you're bringing in wisely. Spend it in players wisely and then doing it once and time again. The, the biggest problem at this point in time at Celtic is that's not been a consistent basis, which is what Ange Postigogo needs to do. But it's yeah. by no means a, a, a fix overnight, is it? No, not at all. And again, Celtic fans, I think we've all got a propensity to look at the world in the petri dish of the last match, you know, and that is the make and break of everyone's Celtic career and the way that we're playing and if somebody's good or not, you know. And yeah, so often, especially with a Champions League campaign, like you do need to kind of zoom out and think, right, well, I think everyone would have taken third at the beginning. We're still fighting for that. And I think at this point, I say spilled milk. We've just got to charge on with the last two games and try our guests to get four or more points, you know. Um, and, you know, on, on that kind of money note, what you're saying there, like the first thing that pops into my head is I would love to see Ange really push the board if that's the kind of way things happen in the future. And we do just spend all of our budget on one guy or something, you know, if we have like, we almost do have two people to every position at this point. So if you were to get a full transfer budget again, how many players, how many actual people would you want to sign? Probably not more than two, you know, so 
then to maybe go and try and kick it up a level and really then go and spend to get a best player in the world kind of vibe, you know? No, yeah, but it just depends on, you know, an incoming quality talent. You know, I, I know Celtic were linked. That's all they were, were linked with a girl like Edward Mishu in the summer. But looking at somebody like that, you know, it's about it's about looking at the situation Celtic's in and how you do progress forward. Um Throwing money at it is not going to be the quick fix, but I think to consistently compete at this level, you need to have that income coming in, whatever it is, whether you're spending it or not. Well, and I say or not, you, you know, I don't mean by, you know, 40 million, because then you don't yeah. spend a, a, a iota of it, but, you know, Celtic's usual time probably spend 25 million in 15 goals, but it's just to, you know, modern football works. You're not going to get that money from the league. And it's all about that being a, a, a process that works hand in hand with each other. Money comes in, players come in, players depart, you hopefully get big fees for them, and that consistently happens. And the only way, you know, Celtic's going to consistently get in the Champions League at this point in time is winning the league, and it's back to probably that main focus. So, but, you know, if you'd have said to me, going back a year ago, that, you know, we'd be here four days after the Champions I probably wouldn't have expected us to be in the Champions League. Uh, I think there's a lot of people probably hesitant about winning the title last year. It, it needs to be a... A process of patience, I think, under Ange Postecoglou, you need to stick with what the manager is trying to achieve and, and trust the process is probably my message. Um, yeah. And this morning, even though I was really peed off last night, I think it's, you know, I'm still on the roller coaster of Ange Postecoglou. I maybe had my hands up in the air and made time and I might have kind of went back on to hold the bar, but I'm still well in the roller coaster. <laughs> I was spitting fairness after the game, just so much of it just. Oh, absolutely boiled my blood in terms of the, some of the chances that were missed. And like I say, I just, the, I was just, how do you not play Kyogo at the weekend and sub him off tonight? Like, I just could not, my head couldn't take that. I, I seen that happen tonight in front of me. Left my head on, took off Kyogo. Kyogo didn't play at all at the weekend. Anyway, I don't want to get back in tip because it just melted me last night. I couldn't handle it. Um, <laughs> made no sense. But like you said, there, you know, the lens of this isn't finished yet. Once the two games go by, that's when you can look at this group stage and go, lessons learned, bruises taken, you know. But if we pick up four points, we'll go, lessons learned, bruises taken, and we're still in. yippee ki -yay. What a debut season in Europe um, for, for some of these players. And, you know, and just, just kind of second year, obviously, I Europe played last year. But it's a totally different perspective on everything. I think European football, for, for me, was the right off last year, as well as the situation it inherited. You know, if you look at... What we went Fair into enough, the yeah. games against Midtjylland with, I didn't expect us to get past Altmar. I keep saying that we probably overachieved in European football last year. This was going to be the the, the big test. And the big test for you going in your second season and being be the Champions League for a club that's not been in it for five years is going to be a hell of a task for you. Um, yeah. And it's about getting to a point which you need to hope that the Ange does stick around. Because from a Celtic perspective, you know, I mentioned that consistent run and European football, that happened because we had managers that were at the club, you know, four or five years. Um, yeah. We need something like that to be at this level. We, we can't just have a rotational uh, evolving door of it, but we need it all uh, hand in hand. But as always, thanks to all our listeners for joining us. We hope that we've maybe cheered you up, hopefully not put you down after last night, as I'm sure there's probably still many people who are having their, their coffee or whatnot, um, maybe looking at the newspapers this morning or, or Twitter or whatever, still in a bit of a bad mood, but... Um, Celtic back in action at the weekend against Hibs. It'll be a tough game. I think, you know, Hibs come into this really in good form. I know they, they, they lost their last out in there um, against the United, um, which I'm, I'm sure they, they weren't too best pleased about, but they've, they've got a decent start to this season, um, which I'm sure Lee Johnson will be pretty pleased about. Uh, last night, they were defeated 1-0 by Dundee United to two good results for Dundee United and Oakwinny, beating Aberdeen yeah. and Hibs. But um, been an interesting game at the weekend. We'll be back next week talking after that game against Hibs, probably previewing the game against Motherwell in the League Cup. But uh, Quinny, as always, thanks for joining me um, on the Celtic Here podcast.